Awesome. Well, we're going to go straight into the sermon. Um, how are we all? Good. We're all here. My name's Jack, Gio, Joaquino, um, whatever you want to call me. Um, how awesome. How awesome was that time of worship? Um, for those who don't know me, um, I run the worship team. I run the worship team at, um, at, 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 at this church, um, and I'm here to speak on communal worship. So we've been talking about spiritual practices over the past, um, over the past few weeks, or maybe a couple months now. Um, so I've been asked to share on the idea of like worshiping together, communal worship. Um, we worship in a lot of different ways as Christians. Um, actually, before I get into it, I might just pray over everyone because I, I think out of that time of worship, we experienced God and we, and, and we felt a bit closer to Him. So I really want us to continue that and to actually really focus on Him this morning. Is that all right? Yeah? It's okay if we focus on God? Cool. All right. Dear Lord Jesus, I really thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together, Lord God. I thank you that um, we're here as your children, as your people, as your kingdom people, Lord Jesus, and that we have come to gather and honor you, Lord Jesus. And I just pray more this, this morning, Lord, that um, as we come to honor you, we would just learn and know more about you through the simple gathering and teaching and Worship together, Lord, that we would learn more about you and we would know you better. In your name I pray. Amen. Awesome. All right. So the idea of worship. So worship, the idea of it is to take our eyes off ourselves and fix them on God who loves us more than we can ever understand. So I want to talk about what is worship. I want to establish, firstly, what worship is, because I'm going to talk about communal worship, worship together. But I want to start with real basic, what is worship? And I want to establish right away that worship is not just expressed through singing together. That's what I'm going to be predominantly talking about, but it is definitely not that. So I want to talk about what that means, like what it means to actually worship God. And we worship Him by putting Him above anything else in our life and really actually worshiping Him, putting Him on the throne of our lives. When I say on the throne of our lives, that's like a very Christianese term, but it is very much the idea is that He is the... He's the king of what we do. So when someone's on the throne of our lives, we follow his instruction, we follow their instruction. So what does it look like to do that? So I'm going to use some, some of Jesus' teaching to show you guys what um, worship actually looks like. So I'm going to talk about the Beatitudes. Who's heard of these before? There's a few of you. I, I thought there would have been more, but that's okay. All right, we're going to read through these, and I really want to focus on what I've underlined. What I've underlined are the actual um, attributes of those of, 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 of what I see, of what I see Jesus is actually painting the picture of worship. So let's read it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And here's the kicker. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are simple things. They're not extravagant things. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those pure in heart, those who are merciful, who are peacemakers, those who are persecuted. This is the, this is the picture. This is the life that Jesus led. This is what we, as, as Christians, this is, this is how we show our worship and how we show our love and dedication to God and how we show and honor our lives to be like His this is what it looks like to live a life of worship. So let's keep this in mind as I'm talking through communal worship and everything. I don't, I don't want to just talk about the, the, the simple, the like act of just singing or the act of um, coming together and praying together or, or, or any singular thing. It's about a life. It's about your whole life living in worship. I think we've talked about in Romans 12, like sacrifice, giving yourself as a living sacrifice. This is what it looks like. 
But even more than that, why do we even do that? It's all in the first line of each one of these ones, blessed. This is, this is God, God's promise to us that, that, that we will actually be, um, if, if, if we live by these principles, we will be blessed. So if we talk, I'm going to talk through 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 to show you a bit more about this. So, so we do not lose heart, for our outer self is wasting away, our inner self, for th- though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It makes clear this. All those things, all those beatitudes, all those difficult things, being meek, being persecuted, being poor in spirit, all those things are not just because God wants to see us suffer. God God isn't giving us, isn't telling us to live that sort of life because He wants us to be downtrodden or disheartened or 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 lo- or lowly in 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 um in in stature, but he actually wants us to. He's doing it to prepare us for an eternal way of glory beyond all comparison. This is a really it's a really beautiful perspective of what worship looks like. It doesn't look like us uh, us up like me when I'm standing up the front when Mum's singing up the front. It's not it's not this thing where we're trying to like try to elevate ourselves above other people. We are actually trying to show ourselves as humble and less and understanding that we are not anything compared to Jesus and compared to God and compared to what he's done for us. It's this idea that this affliction that we feel and this pain that we feel in this life today is preparing us for this weight of glory beyond all comparison. This is, the, this is that blessing. This is, what, this is what we're striving for. This is just the foundation. This is what worship is. This is what living a life like Jesus is and to and for what worship is. But then, if we're talking about why we worship, that's, that's what worship is, then let's, let's break down the other part of communal worship, the gathering together of people, um, which is basically church. So, when I talk about church, I'm not going to be talking about this service. It's not just a Sunday service. I'm not going to be talking about pop-up kitchen on Wednesdays. I'm not even going to be talking about when we, when we go and do grow groups together. I'm talking about the community and the fellowhood of all believers. So church, in its purest essence, is what God has established as basically all Christians gathering together. That is the church. When we talk about the body of Christ being, being the church, we talk about all Christians, all believers being the church. So even so like the people down the road that gather in a church, the people in um, a different country that gather that, that gather together as Christians, they're all part of the same church as us. We are the church in, in general. So why do we gather together? The answer to this is, is quite varied and many. Um, the Bible has really excellent practical ways that we can live together. Um, a lot of them basically illustrated through the one another and each other um, principles. Has anybody heard of those? Come on, there's some people that have heard of those. You've got to respond to me when I ask a question, all right? Has anybody heard of one another and each other? I like that some people said no. That's good. Um, here's some that I've got here. This, is, this sits in my car. I actually, I put it in there to read it, but then you don't read when you're driving, do you? So I should probably put it somewhere else. But these, these are all these principles that Jesus um, laid out in his teaching, but also what the, what the apostles laid out, Paul, Peter, um, James, and the like. These are all things that we do together as, as Christians, um, as the church. Dad's spoken to them a couple of times before. Um, this, is, this is why I've got this copy. One is speak to another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So that's sort of where I connect best. That's what I'll talk about a bit more later. But essentially, that's, that's what it means to sort of like gather together. But let's not go forward too much too quickly. We wanna, I want to talk about the church in the perspective of God's kingdom because that's the central that's one of the central themes of what Jesus' teachings are, is the kingdom of heaven and the fact that it's coming through now. So, um, in his ministry, in Jesus' ministry, he makes really clear that the church, us as believers, is central to God's kingdom or the kingdom of heaven. I'll use that I- interchangeably when I say the, I'm, I'm saying the same thing. Um, I've actu- I actually read this book recently called Kingdom Conspiracy. Um, uh, which people tend to make fun of because it's called conspiracy. But it is a very good book. If you want to read it, it takes a lot of effort to read, but you should definitely read it. Um, it's by a guy called Scott McKnight. 
and he covers the, the kingdom of heaven really well. But he goes into painstaking detail in a lot of different areas. But I want to talk about how he unpacks a really critical passage for like our, um, for our, I guess, beliefs as Christians. This is Matthew 16, verse 16 to 19. This is the founding passage for the church. So the, the disciples are gathering together talking about who Jesus is. So that's what's happening right here. Jesus is basically um, asking them who he is. And, ask, and testing them to see what they come up with a response. And Peter says this, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is a very, very, very critical revelation for us as Christians. This is the founding passage that Jesus is basically, this is where Jesus first talks about building his, his church. I'm going to focus on that perspective. But I want to talk about this revelation and what it means for us as a church now and why we gather together. So first thing I want to talk about that Scott McKnight talks about, Jesus is king. So that's the first, that's the first point. Peter reveals that Jesus is king through this revelation. So when Peter says, um, you are the Christ, son of the living God, he's revealing that, Je- that Jesus is king. So if we're in the kingdom of heaven, and a kingdom, of heaven, a, a kingdom has to have a leader, a king. So Jesus is the king of heaven, yeah? Does that make sense? Does it? I, yeah. Cool? Oh, my gosh. Come on. Does it make sense? All right. Can you repeat back to me? Jesus is king. All right, cool. That's good. I'm glad you guys got that. Um, That's a pretty important part. But then the next part I want to talk about is is Peter's revelation, and that is the foundation of the church. So this is probably the part that might get a little bit controversial. So I'm I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of Peter's revelation um, about who Jesus is and what Jesus actually says to Peter after he has this revelation. Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, and that on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is establishing that the church is his. I, re- I really want to be clear. He says, I tell you, and on this rock I will build my church. Yeah? It's Jesus' church. So if Jesus is saying, this is my church, that implies that he's the leader of the church. Yeah? So if he's the leader of the church, Jesus is. Jesus is the head of the church it talks about in the um, in the uh, in in the letters later on in the Bible, then that then that means that if Jesus is the King of the Kingdom and He's leader of the Church, if He's the leader of both, then those two are closely t- intertwined. Yeah, does that make sense? The Kingdom of Heaven and the Church they're both inter- closely intertwined, and basically, Kingdom people are Church people because they're both led by the same head. Yeah, makes sense. Doesn't. Sorry, choice. We'll talk. We'll talk a little bit more later, I guess, but. The, the, idea, the idea is that this, is this revelation that Peter has that Jesus is king of, of God's kingdom and he's king of us as people, as kingdom people, then that means that that, that revelation is that rock that, 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 that the church is built on, yeah? That revelation is what we're built on. That's why we gather together because we all see Jesus as king and we, and we honor him as our leader and as our God and as our Lord. So that's why Jesus changes Peter's name from Simon to Peter. Peter means Petros, or it's, it's, it's basically translated to Petros in Greek. And um, rock, I mean, the word rock actually translates to Petra. So they're both very similar, both, both sort of like the same sort of root words. So Jesus is really, exa- really like actually saying, Peter, this revelation that you've had is going to define you and, and going to help you set up the church, Yeah. Yeah, but but I must I need to be abundantly clear. Jesus is the King of the Church, not Peter. Peter helped to establish the Church. He's a very very important central figure to our faith. But Jesus is the King, yeah, always and forever. Amen. Awesome, that's good. And lastly, Jesus then says, Peter, and I've said it here on behalf of the Church, receives the keys to the kingdom. So Jesus says this in verse nineteen: I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is critical. Peter's, Jesus is basically linking the acts that Peter will take to the acts that happen in heaven, yeah? 
And he's not saying this just, just for Peter, and that's only for Peter, and that's it. He's saying that for the church in general, yeah? He's giving the keys of the kingdom to the church so that, so that the church may loose God's acts in heaven, yeah? Our, our actions here as the church, when we gather together, our actions here have spiritual significance and consequence. They have consequence beyond just what we do on the day to day. When we gather together and we and we encourage each other, when we do these one another and each other principles, it's not just here and now that that has an impact. It has a spiritual and like heavenly significance and consequence. It makes brings some more importance to our actions and, and, and to the weight of what we do. And it's why and that and more importance to why we gather together and actually worship together. Um, Scott puts it this way. He says, and this, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. What, what is revealed here by Jesus is that the church and kingdom are indissolubly connected. Who's heard of that word before? Good, I hadn't heard of it either. Um, it means impossible to take apart or bring to an end. That the church and kingdom are impossible to take apart or bring to an end. What goes on in one goes on in the other. Amen? This is the beautiful thing about the church relating to the kingdom is that the kingdom is this future thing. Like we are going to see the kingdom come and that is basically the end, that, that, that is our beautiful picture of the end of time and what, what we're going to receive with him, with God in the end. And that's what, we, that's what we set our eyes to our hope for the future. But we can see the kingdom coming through now in the church, in the gathering of us as saints of, 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 um, of, of Christ. So the Beatitudes gives us a picture of what the kingdom of heaven will look like. When we read the Beatitudes, that's what the kingdom of heaven will look like. But then Peter's revelation shows us that the kingdom of heaven is linked with church. In other words, followers of Jesus who worship in spirit and in, shu- in truth. So if we bring that all together, we are God's kingdom. And in gathering together, in living like Jesus lived, the, the kingdom is revealed in some small part. So it's a, it's a big concept. God's kingdom is really hard to picture and it's hard to comprehend. Like this, this book that, that Scott McKnight wrote is so, is so massively, it's really hard to get across. Like I, I've picked up a couple of bits and pieces from it and this is one that I really, really think is key. But one thing I, I really want to understand is that we can get a glimpse of God's kingdom through the church. We can get a glimpse of that beautiful future that's painted in Revelation through us gathering together and actually supporting and building each other up and doing those one another and each other principles. So we can receive some of that blessing and that we can share it with others and we can actually spread the love that Jesus shows us. Amen. Awesome. So let's bring it all let's let's bring it all home. Why do we worship together? So now we understand what worship is in some small part and we understand why we gather together. Um, we want to talk about why we worship together. Um, in the perfect world, we would, we would worship God just by gathering together, basically. So if, that's, if, the, church is, um, show, if the church is us being together and, um, and our worship is through, our, is through how we live our lives, then, we just, then just by gathering together, we're worshiping Him. But we often have to take deliberate actions in this world because we're not, we're not there yet. We're not at the end product of our faith. That's what sanctification is. That's what all this stuff about growing and actually why we have all these letters and all these things that actually teach us about who God is because we're not there yet. We don't say a prayer to, to, to like follow God or commit in our hearts to follow God and then we're just there and we're perfect. It takes time. So, okay. So, so, it, so it is sort of like I, I, I want to illustrate some of the reasons why we worship together um, and actually talk about, pr- pr- talk about the idea of singing together as the predominant way that, as, as, as sort of like an allegory for how we can worship together. So sort of like, that's my metaphor or my example is, is singing together because that is a really practical way that we can actually demonstrate worship and actually lift God above ourselves. So, I mean, God's given us music to enable this act of worship together. It's this beautiful thing that God's given us, really, really powerful, um, moving, uh, what's the word for it? Like, thing. I don't know what the right word for it is. Expression, I guess. I don't know. It's this creation. Like, like, like. I, I don't know many people who don't like music. And even if you don't, like, like singing together has real power. Like, there's real, like, actual vibe, and 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 it generates something. So, 
a few, so I've, I've got three reasons why we worship together via singing, and we're going to sing a bit together as well. So my first reason is unity, not uniformity, not um, any other sort of concept, but unity. I've spoken to this a little bit before, but unity is a foundation of God's kingdom, and it's actually a prayer that Jesus makes for us. So I want to read from John 17, when Jesus is, Jesus is basically praying um, at the end of his mi- ministry, well, I wouldn't say the end of his ministry, but right before he's going to die, he's, he's, in, he's in the garden and he's praying, and he's praying for his disciples, he's praying for future believers, and, he's, and, he's, and he says this at the very end of John 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me and I have given to them, that they may that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that as the so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. It is a little bit wordy, I think it's the translation, but the the idea of this that I want re- really want to point out is Jesus is praying this. He prays this for us as believers. He's, he's, he's just prayed for the disciples and he's prayed for people who believe him now, back in that time. But now he's praying for us. He's praying for everyone that's, that's to come. He's praying for all who will believe in me through the word. He prays these words. This is our king, the leader of the church, the leader of the kingdom. This is who we trust and follow. He prays that, that we may all be one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. Yeah? That is, we talk about the Trinity, we talk about the importance of that. It is so central and so beyond what what we usually can think and actually experience. But Jesus prays this, he prays that we might be one, we might be unified as the same way that Jesus and the Father are unified, that we may become perfectly one, it says here. This is, this is, um, Obviously, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not saying that, like, just by singing together, we'll, 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 we'll hit that. But it shows us that we actually need to strive for this. And we actually need to try and work at being unified with each other. We need to love each other and actually show each other kindness and, grat- kindness and grace and actually have time and, and, um, and patience with people, even though we might not agree with them, because we need to be one and unified as a church. We don't need to be uniform. We don't need to all say and and speak exactly the same thing, dress the same way. We all are individuals, and we all have our own personalities and beliefs. But we have one unifying belief: is that Jesus is King, yeah. And that's the thing that we that that, and that's the thing that we're trying to do by worshiping. We want to become one, and that's the thing that music can do. Like music is is when 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 people all sing together, it's a, it's one of the most beautiful things you can ever hear. Like if you've listened to a choir sing, I remember in um. In France, we woke up early in the morning and wanted to take us to look at this beautiful lookout that was actually pretty average in the end. But sorry, Emma. But it was we got to the top and there was this church, and we walked in and we and we sort of like I think Mum and I walked up to the to the church, and there was this beautiful choir singing at like seven in the morning, and it was just it was very very moving, and it was like it sounded absolutely stunning, and it sort of moves you, or even when. You're in a massive crowd, and you hear people all singing together, all singing as one. It is such a really powerful moment. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced it. Um, it's, it's this thing about singing that actually brings us together. It actually does unify us, even if it's just for a moment. Even if it's just for a moment, it does unify us and, and, and can have more of an impact. So this simple act, if, I'm, if, if I go back to what, what, what Jesus said in, um, to Peter... This simple act of declaring God's word together in unity as the church has the power to loose or bind heavenly things, yeah? It's clear that this action as the church has power beyond the natural and should be treated with reverence. So we have this act of singing that can bring us unity, this act of worship that can bring us unity. Another thing that it helps us to do is to remember or understand who God is, or do both, to remember and understand who God is. So I'm going to talk about songs um, throughout time. Throughout time, from, um, from the beginning of time to whenever, um, 
words, songs have been used to sort of tell stories and songs have been used to basically help people understand and remember things. It can be seen in many, many cultures across the, across the globe. Um, we see it in Aboriginal so song lines and Celtic, Celtic folk tunes and many other cultures. I think you can look at any culture and find that music is central to how they understand and teach and learn things. Um, it's clear that's, that's how we learn. That's one way we can learn and remember. I don't know if you guys have studied for an exam. Like when I did it, I used to listen to the same s albums over and over again so that I could actually use the music because the music actually helps you to remember things better. It's actually, it's very, it's, it, it can be very powerful. Um, and this is definitely no less true for God's children, the Israelites. We have 150 Psalms that the book is, that, that the Bible has basically written out for us. Um, the Psalms are how we would, are, are how the Israelites would remember who God is and the good things he did for them over the generations. So you've, you read a few different things in the Psalms, but in the ones where they're really singing together, they talk about who God is. They'll talk about how good He is. They'll talk about how faithful He is. But then there will also be Psalms that actually talk about the things that, he've, that He's done to really remind the Israelites of the things that He's done for them. There's a couple of good ones that aren't actually Psalms, but they are songs that Moses sings. So one, he sings in Exodus 15. He sings in celebration after the Israelites have been taken out of Egypt. So him and uh, Miriam... Yep, Miriam. Basically, they lead the Israelites in worship. Um, once they leave the the um, once they get get out of the Red Sea and they're actually walking into the wilderness and they're celebrating, they're dancing and they're singing for joy that God has led them out of this captivity and this um this uh, this oppression. But he also sings another song, um, Moses in Deuteronomy 32, right before he dies. Now Moses has ba M M Moses basically became the central teacher and someone who actually spoke with God and was living with God and would actually really be the, 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 the conduit for God's message to the children of Israel, who were basically God's people at that time. And um, he, right before he dies, he wants to make sure and he, he wants to remind the children of Israel God's word, what God has done for, for them and the, and the laws that he's, that he's given them, like his word for them. Because one thing you have to understand about, like, the law and everything, like, Jesus did come to, like, um, to, to put that to one side and basically provide a way, a straight way to him. But before that, the law was God's word, and that was the only thing they had of God. This was their central founding understanding of who God is. So, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses starts, he, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long, but this is basically the start. So, G so Moses says, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. So Moses is a little bit poetic, a bit dramatic, but um, he, he's, basically, he's basically saying, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to my teaching. May it actually drop and fall on as as rain upon you and actually help you to and and help you to grow like he's talking about rain upon grass that like that helps them to grow he's talking about singing and this song that that he shares as a way to actually teach and remind the israelites of who god is and what god has done for them yeah so it's really it's really important to understand that that music is not just important for um is, is not just a nice feeling. It's actually really good at teaching and really good at actually setting and establishing things in our hearts about who God is. It takes our eyes off ourselves and puts them on God, who we are as the church, God's people. So one other thing um, about worship with God's songs is the revelation of prophecy through Psalms. So Psalms also, so while it helps us to remember and to, um, and to understand who God is, it actually does prophesy things. And through worshiping together, we can actually experience some like further understanding about our own lives and the lives of our church and the lives of of, of this world um, through song and through prophecy. One um, really amazing thing that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, but I, I found really amazing when I first heard it, is Psalm 22. So, at the start of Psalm 22, the first verse says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" I'm sure most people would know where that comes from as well. Jesus says that on the cross right before he dies. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we hear that, well, for years when I heard that, I always just thought it was God 
uh, Jesus being really, um, sa- basically really beaten and, and tired and sad. But it actually, it's like, it's like if we were to hear someone say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We wouldn't, we wouldn't just think, oh, nice, nice, little, nice little word. We would think, oh, this is the song, amazing grace. Someone's going to sing that song. When Jesus said that l- opening line, they would understand that he's talking about the whole of Psalm 22. So if you read the whole of Psalm 22, it's a lot more, it's, it's not just quite crying out in anguish. It's actually, it actually talks about a man, I think it's David who writes this one, who actually is crying out and, and desperate for God, but he actually acknowledges and understands that God will save him. There's this verse 24, which is amazing. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. So this is Jesus we think of him broken and beaten, but he actually is acknowledging the amazing power of God through music, through psalms, through song. And it's that beautiful moment that actually um, shows who, um, who Jesus is um, and shows, shows that he um, is God's beloved or like he's God, will, God rescues him um, and he trusts that God will, will rescue him even though he is about to die. Last point I want to make. From the same psalm, God inhabits the praises of his people. So I'm going to read a bit, a bit more of Psalm 22, verse 3 to 5. Um, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises or dwelling in the praises of Israel. In you our fathers or parents trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. I'm not spending too long on this point, um, as I've already spoken about this all throughout the message. Um, The church is characterized by worship, and Jesus is the leader of the church, the king. If God's kingdom is shown in the church when we worship together, then it follows that God is there and placed above us or enthroned when we praise him. It talks about Worship being putting God on the throne of our heart, yeah, but at the start. So if God's kingdom is shown in the church, when we, so I want to read that again. God's kingdom is shown in the church when we worship together, then it follows that God is there and placed above us. He's enthroned when we praise Him, yeah? It's through us, so it's not like God needs us to praise Him and needs us to worship Him, but He's enthroned, but like through our worship, through our praise that we actually bring to, to God, He is enthroned on our hearts. And not just not just each individually our hearts, but actually our hearts as the church. We are acknowledging him as the church, as the throne, as the leader, as the king of our of us as people. This passage stresses that these are the praises of God's people. It says here, enthroned on the praises of Israel, which at that time that is God's children. That's God's people. There's that's that's what they understood. So this is not a call for us to worship individually, to go home to our bedrooms and worship by ourselves. This is a call to worship together. Yeah? This isn't a call to just um, take take time away for ourselves, which is good. Like, take, t- taking time away from us for ourselves, Jesus does that over and over again. But this important thing about enthro- being enthroned on the, on the praises of Israel, it is... It is about worshiping together as a church. It's a call to praise together as churches. So then if he, if he inhabits our praises as the church, then what a foretaste of deliverance it is to praise His holy name. What a blessing it is to lift our eyes off of ourselves and fix them on God, not seeing ourselves as more than we ought, but understanding we are the church, His people, His kingdom. So, why don't we let go of individuality and focus on unity with us as brothers and sisters in the kingdom of heaven, in the church? Let go of who we want to be 
and focus on who God is. To let go of reservation and praise God who responds with blessing. So, I want us to spend some time worshipping together. I want us to spend some time in unification, or in unity, sorry. I want us to spend some time remembering who God is and actually taking our eyes off of ourselves and looking on God. So that we, as, um, as God's church, may actually be, may actually put God on the throne of us, yeah? Put God in the position of power over us because He has that power, He has that authority, but we need to acknowledge that. We need to actually understand that and let Him lead us in every single moment of our lives. So I'm going to pray. And then I'd ask you all to stand and we'll sing together. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us your love, Lord God. Thank you for not withholding your presence, not withholding your Holy Spirit back from us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this beautiful, this beautiful grace that you showed us, Lord, by going to a cross and dying for us that we might, we might be blessed to follow you that we might experience deliverance and experience your, your love and your grace more than we could ever even understand. And Lord, I just pray that as we go forward as a church, Lord God, that you would give us, or you would show us um, how to live, Lord God. You would help us to understand who you are. You would reveal to us your presence, Lord God, and you would, you would, you would see our worship and acknowledge it as... Um, Acknowledge it and respond with blessing like you promised, Lord. I thank you that you promised that. I thank you that we can trust in your words and trust in your promise. So, Lord, I just respond and I, I give myself, Lord God, and I give my, my, the things that I want and the things that, I, the things that I have desired, Lord God, and I give them over to you that you might bring over the desires of my heart, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we worship you. Let's sing this together. All my words go short.